Jai Hind, welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achind. In my quest to learn about China, is something I've tried to do over the past two years on this platform. I have spoken to very different people where we've analyzed the military, we've analyzed the economics, we've analyzed foreign affairs, we've analyzed the BRI, and so on and so forth. So many different China Watch series where we've talked about various different aspects of China. Today, we're going to talk about a little new aspect, which is the mentality of the Chinese people, the mentality of China itself, since the CCP. Of course, a lot will be dependent on the CCP with regards to how Chinese people think. On that aspect, I have with me Dr. Shripana Pathak, who is an associate professor and the director of the Center for Northeast Asian Studies at the School of International Affairs at OP Jindal University, Haryana. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shripana, for actually coming and talking to me. I believe you've stayed in China. You've ex tasted the CCP, if I may. And, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to hear your insights with regards to the Chinese mentality. Thank you so much for having me, Adi. You've been doing excellent work. And, uh, you know, I've listened to some of um, your episodes and you're doing really great work. So thank you so much for having me on board. Thank you so much. Looking forward for a long association as well. Uh, so let me open with this, you know, uh, uh, how do Chinese people actually think about what's happening with their country? Uh, is the average Chinese person as interested about China uh, as the average Indian is about India? So, you know, Chinese people also are just people. So these questions of livelihood, these questions of employment, these also hit them. And, uh, you know, this whole white paper movement or the white paper revolution, as it was called, this also happened because Chinese people just could not take, you know, the basic violation of the right to live for three years being under a lockdown is just not, um, you know, just not tenable. So Chinese people are also people just the way, you know, the rest of us are. And uh, for them, these questions of what is happening in China becomes important to them because they have to live in the country and they have to grapple with the politics. So they also are very interested, just the way an average Indian is more interested in, say, domestic politics, because domestic politics, okay, what's happening between, say, a particular party, party and B particular uh, party, uh, these sorts of things would actually impact the lives of people. Similarly for China, there is just one party, the CCP. Uh, what policies is the CCP coming up with? How is it going to impact them? Would unemployment increase? Would inflation soar? These sorts of questions are very important and the Chinese read a lot. You know, um, you know they have attained that sort of 100% literacy. It's not in English or you know any other foreign language, but in Chinese. Um, so they read, and they read newspapers a lot. That's interesting to know because uh, uh, the average Chinese and his understanding about how his government works and what are the policies of the government, is it as clear and is it as inquisitive uh, as we find it in, in the rest of, if I may, the democratic world? So, um, you know, with regards to government policies, of course, the CCP will come up with these grand narratives and these grand slogans. Um, and it's very difficult for the Chinese people to decipher when it does come out in the headlines or it does come out in the newspapers. So they also wait and watch as to what exactly is going to, how is it really going to unfurl and unfold? But they do read it up because they also want to do two plus two or read between the lines and find out what exactly does it mean for them? So um, they are also acutely aware. And because they don't really have any other alternative, there is no opposition, of course. So they really need to know what's ahead of them so that they can prepare. And Chinese people always want to prepare. You know, there are these big sort of things which, um, for example, I'll give you, uh, you know, um, it's often said that uh, China's consumption is not great. You know, uh, and that's one of the problems with the Chinese economy. Their domestic consumption is not great. Um, it fell down further during the lockdown years. But why is the consumption not really that great? It's a very simple reason which gets tied to their culture and to their history. Because of the horrors of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, the severe malnourishment, malnutrition which occurred because of governance failures under Mao Zedong, 
Chinese people had absolutely nothing to eat, right? So when you meet a Chinese people and, uh, you know, after the normal hello, ni hao, uh, the next question is, ni uh, lama or did you have food? So it's a bit odd, but why do they ask, have you had food? You know, this when the Great Leap Forward was happening, people out of genuine concern asked each other, have you had food? Because maybe if I have some, I'll share with you. So that percolated into their culture, right? And because they've had so many tragedies because of their government policies, Chinese people need to know what is there in the future. This happened all over to them again because of zero COVID. So they really need to know what's ahead because so that they can save, so that they can save their lives. As simple as that, save money and save their lives. So um, it's difficult being a Chinese citizen. That's an interesting perspective. Is that why the Chinese keep talking about bumper harvests uh, within their agriculture and stuff like that, in spite of have, having uh, terrible droughts in places where there's supposed to be excess water and in drier places having terrible floods? Uh, Food security has always been <clears throat> a problem within China. And, uh, you know, even during the Great Leap Forward, you know, Mao Zedong used to, yeah, there were these inflated um, figures about how there's been a bumper harvest. Right now also there's, an, there's a huge agrarian crisis which is happening within China. But the state, the propaganda is so huge within China. I'll tell you another interesting thing. Almost every university in China has a propaganda department. <laughs> I, it's, it's bizarre, you know, why, why do universities need to have propaganda department? But, well, they do. And um, all these sorts of things, you know, just... It's the CCP's ploy to show to the people that everything is in control. Everything is in order and nothing's going wrong. People should not really panic. So, um, which is why these things, bumper harvest, Chinese economy rebounding, these sorts of headlines keep making the rounds. I mean, uh, propaganda is good. Uh, the problem with propaganda, and I, as, as I look at it, is that propaganda needs to be based on the truth. Otherwise, it's it falls flat, and when it does fall flat, it actually goes to the ground. Uh, mm -hmm. One can witness that in Europe to a large extent uh, with regards to economic structures and this and that. But that's a different story, different discussion, different day. What I want to talk to you about is uh, in recent times, have you come across an incident where the Chinese people have felt let down by their government? in an incident apart from COVID. COVID is something I'll, I'll keep for a little later because that, that derives a whole different structure of the Chinese thought process. But pre-COVID, let's say 2019, have you witnessed or have you read about an incident where the Chinese people have said, no, this is, this is not, not okay? So um, Chinese people also, because we humans, uh, you know, by nature are, uh, well, we are humans, we love talking. Um, Chinese people also talk amongst themselves. And they also, when their rights are violated, even they know, even even when they do know, when they you know actually don't have fundamental rights enshrined in the constitution the way we have, uh, they expect some basic um, support from the government in the sense that, you know, their money would not be taken away, their savings would not be taken away, or their land would not be confiscated. So, but that often happens in China because the government, you know, will come and confiscate your property. So there are millions and millions and millions of these stories wherein, you know, an old person who's lived all her life in a particular place, but then is told by the local authorities that, hey, look, we are going to create a, I don't know, five star a mall, etc. over here and you need to go. And she'd be like, no. So she would try to mobilize. She would talk to other people. And other people also might have faced the same sort of things. So um, they do mobilize. Protests do happen. Chinese also have been protesting a lot um, with regards to environmental standards going down. You know, um, fish is dying in rivers because of extreme pollution. And this, is, this was, um, you know, when I saw dead fishes um, floating in the rivers in China. Um, but... Uh, People do protest because if there is so much of lead poisoning, which is uh, you know killing the fishes, it's not really safe for the people. Also, yeah, when people consume the fish, so there have been a lot of protests, like physical protests per se. Um, but of course, the CCP is ab in absolute control, um, so it's um, you know it, it, the protest gets um, 
dissipated very quickly because uh, the CCP has all sorts of control over power. But given the fact that we are living in the technology generation, um, the technology years, Chinese people, in order to express their discontentment with a lot of things the way they happen in China, have used the social media. Social media is also under heavy surveillance, but the Chinese use very creative mechanisms. I'll just give you two examples. Um, uh, one is the Me Too movement, and uh, just the way gender equality is a faraway dream in every part of the world. It is the case even in socialist China, wherein you know there should have been equality, but it's not there. Uh, these cases of Peng Shuai, well, Peng Shuai is a big name and well, she was a player, at, like, you know, uh, she was an athlete and that's why her headlines have hit the news. Um, she's disappeared, but that's another story for another day. Uh, but yeah, um, gender equality or workplace harassment, these are real issues which hit the Chinese people. So when the Me Too movement came up, the Me Too uh, hashtag got banned in China. So what the Chinese people did is that they started using this um, hashtag which translates into rice rabbit because uh, me in Chinese is uh, rice and uh, for two they made it two two is uh, rabbit so rice rabbit hashtag rice rabbit um, so that's how they trick the censors to post on social media then um, you know very recently um, there was the bank banking crisis um, you know because there were um, the bank deposits in Henan province were frozen so people people were angry of course it's people's savings you know so you cannot really mess with that that's the basic thing chinese people save their money so that they can shield themselves from any sort of governance malfunction which may, might happen but then now banks are bank deposits are also getting frozen so what where do they do so just to express their frustration they started writing on social media but of course the moment there was a word hanan that was getting censored so Chinese people use the word Herlan. Herlan in, um, um, in, in Mandarin basically means the Netherlands. And uh, that's how they bypassed the censors and they kept the conversation going. So um, Chinese people also protest. They also have problems in the way the government has been functioning. And there are myriads and myriads of examples. Um, but I, I, I strongly believe it's tiring to think of a way around to express one's dissent. One more thing which I wanted to just uh, mention, you know, we think propaganda has to be based on some amount of truth because we've lived in democracies all our lives. Uh, but in China, propaganda is based on absolutely nothing at all. And it is just given out to the people so that the CCP can stay in power, so that the people don't challenge the supremacy of the CCP. So propaganda, be it in the 1950s, be it even right now, you know, plastered all over the walls of China, you know, how Xi Jinping thought is great and uh, how there's going to be a Chungo, uh, you know, the realization of uh, Chungo Meng or China dream is going to happen and China is going to be the most important kingdom. These these sorts of things are completely, no, I won't even say half-baked. These are like complete lies. So, but since CCP is an absolute control and it's not a democracy, this happens. Complete lies. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, brings me to a point of protest. As a matter of fact, I've also done a show where I've actually mapped protests within China from 1953 onwards. Uh, there are there is a, a protest mapping website, as a matter of fact, where where people are giving inputs and they kind of plot them out and this and that and the other. So protests are pretty common. Uh, there, that's that's I think part of human nature when when you kind of get into a corner, you will raise your voice and stuff like that. Uh, you know, you won't think about the consequences because at that time you're angry. So I guess that is what it is, which brings me to a point where I want to talk about the public display of protests. Now, China, as you kind of hinted and we were talking offline before this, is has a great surveillance and firewall and this and that. Before we get into the situation of protest, what I want to ask you is how is it that in spite of this firewall, all these protests are coming out into, into the rest of the world? Has China not been able to control? Because at the end of it, when we also did see the COVID protests, which we will talk about uh, separately, is that information leaked out? Right? It wasn't restricted. The videos were out there. 
for everybody to see and even now uh i believe there is a there is a south of beijing i i forget the name of this little town where there is a sort of an epidemic where children are getting sick and there were long lines in hospitals and this day before yesterday so see i mean i'm as updated as that and i i can't even read mandarin mm-hmm. how do you look at that so um you know china has tried to uh, ensure that it has absolute control and it has done it through a lot of ways as you mentioned you and i both mentioned you know the firewall but uh, well humans are smart so we found the vpn uh, i used the vpn back between 2011 to 2013 and um, so i was based primarily in beijing so i used to use a free vpn but then when the party congresses or you know any important development would come come close by then the crackdown on vpns would become very severe and very strict all of us on vpn would just stop working uh my chinese friends themselves said use a use a paid vpn it's easier the chinese government cannot really track it down or cannot crack down upon it so um i never used a paid vpn because uh, I'm not wasting more money on you know the CCP. So um, I somehow managed. Um, it wasn't. A, it was just two and a half years. So I managed. But Chinese people do use the VPN, and they use paid VPN, and they had all sorts of information as to how you can use it to you know jump the great um, firewall. Um, how do these protests come out to the rest of the world? The Chinese CCP has tried to um, you know. crack down a lot and uh, you know just before the 20th party congress there were patrols in the entire city so that people do not really protest but yeah there were protests you know um i'm pretty sure you must have read it that you know there was this person who hung up this banner saying you know about things um, writing things against uh, xi jinping and how he needs to really go um because of these sorts of things xi jinping in his um 20th party congress speech also mentioned national security 50 times security stability security stability just showing how important stability is really for china so which is why there are a lot of these sensors there are a lot of surveillance mechanisms um i'll tell you about this interesting mechanism which i found out about um and that happens only in a country which is actually surveilling again back in 2011 so uh, what do you do when you go to say a foreign country you move out of uh, you know um, india for example and uh, when well, you're traveling abroad you need to call back your family your friends etc you just ensure that you have international roaming so that you can make phone calls to your family members right um so when i when actually in in china back in 2011 a it did not really you know the sim just didn't work so fair enough chalo i'll buy a new sim um if you have a new sim you have enough money you can call wherever you want to right uh, but no that's not the case in china if you are trying to make a phone call outside of china you uh, have to buy the special uh, card it's called the ip card basically you get the ip card you scratch it there's a particular number there you feed that into your mobile then you dial your country code and then you dial your parents your spouse your siblings your friends whoever's number you want to what really happens why is there ip card there a it's very expensive uh, b the thing is the moment you you know dial in those numbers there is immediate surveillance which happens you know so um, very interesting innovative ways of um, just ensuring absolute control so that you know these foreigners also do not get in touch with say you know xyz mischievous organizations based um, in country x or country y or country z um just to th- these things are done to maintain absolute control if you go to chinese universities you will see that chinese people's classes are different from foreigners classes even if we are learning the language or the same sort of thing we are never placed in the same class they don't want the sort of ideas which we have of democracy or protest or dissent they don't want that to go into their youth so um various various sorts of um, you know control and surveillance exist but how did these videos really come out i think people have reached that tipping point wherein at least um this this sort of you know covid was i think just the nail in the coffin for 2022 and uh, people just had it so there were just about too many videos maybe uh, there was a slip here or a slip there um, there are lots of innovative technological means as to how you can make the video reach someone else okay you might put a blockade on say vapo vaccine etc but once it reaches someone else based in some other country 
well, it's out. Once it's out, it's really out. So uh, I think that that sort of pace, that sort of pace is something which, this, which the CCP has still, um, it still has to find a mechanism. How do we crack down upon that, you know? Um, so a lot, peop a lot of people made a lot of videos. And as I said, you know, this generation is technology. Whatever happens, just the way the Indian youth behaves or the American youth or the African youth would behave, everything is on the phone. So they also pretty much do the same. And they've, they've really done it. Uh, but really, people were tired of these, um, this sort of lockdown and this sort of crackdown. Since we are talking about, you know, um, violation of basic rights, um, there are lots of incidents and events which do happen. Uh, a few years ago, even much before COVID, actually, two years before, um, you know, vaccines, normal vaccines, not anti-COVID vaccines, normal vaccines are ones which we give to kids. And kids are precious, precious beings to anyone especially if you have a one child, you know. Uh, well, even two children are precious, three children are also precious. But uh, Aussie, given the fact yeah. that yeah, when it's for, for just just stepping into the shoes of a person who has just one child and is allowed only to have one child, this is way before, you know, the one child policy was relaxed. Um, if that child is given a vaccine, you know, when you go to a public uh, public hospital and that child is given a vaccine, which ensures that she is paralyzed from the waist down, people will protest. And that has happened. Um, so it's it's a really sad state of affairs. And those sorts of stories also have made it to the BBC or have made it elsewhere. Um, there are foreign journalists also who do pick up on these stories, who do pick up these videos. And because it's technology is so fast and it's helped us, of course, um, the CCP has to think of more innovative ways to stop this. At the moment, I think it's a great boon so that even, you know, people like you and me based outside of China can actually see and understand what's really happening there. Um, so good, good for the CCP. Yeah, because funnily speaking, the CCP, instead of keeping quiet about things, speaks. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of people actually, when I started studying, and I'm not a academist, academician or anything when i started looking at china I, it was a big thing for me that how do i read all this stuff so i used to do google translate and this and that then i found places where hey you know what chinese people write themselves mm -hmm. and i mean south china morning post there's lots of articles in the new york times there's that it was interesting to realize that uh, you don't really need to struggle that much to study china you can actually just read their newspapers and Think a little extra than what you would normally about things and ask yourself, why are they saying this at this time? Probably it's a little more easier. Coming to you, you brought out and you, you, you've you kind of hinted the direction of this conversation to COVID. So I'm going to get to that. Uh, I personally say that COVID was a point on the graph of China where China started. Well, China was declining since 2012, but this is like the downfall. Uh, China was declining, it could have rectified and still become a superpower. Today, I say China will never be a superpower. Uh, one, would you agree to that? Two, what kind of an impact did COVID have on the thought process of people where when you look at us in India, we went through a year of lockdown and, you know, some of us loved it because you spent time with family. But beyond that, you didn't. You know, everything came to a standstill. So what has the Chinese people derived out of three years of being locked in? So, you know, um, as you correctly mentioned, China has been declining since 2012, which is why Xi Jinping came up with this term, new normal, wherein, um, you know, double digit growth rates were just not possible. And um, Chinese people would have to <clears throat> live with a lowered um, <clears throat> growth rate. So, um China, as you said, is not going to be the great superpower. It still has dreams. It still has aspirations. It's still thinking of other ways around it, uh, which is why you will see these uh, flurry of visits from Xi Jinping and, uh, you know, his his whole approach to now the West Asian countries. It's trying to do a lot of things, but um, I, I honestly believe that that sort of dream of becoming, um, you know, the greatest or the hegemon of the system, I think it, it's going to wait. It has to, um, you know, the... Two, two plus two is not really happening here. It's um, uh, They don't really have that sort of an economic prowess right now at the moment. Plus, uh, well, you know, lowered fertility rates, population is an important 
part of a country's, um, you know, as Chinese say, comprehensive national power. Um, that's also reduced or that's also um, China now has an old age population. So uh, all sorts of all of these things is going to put a sort of a break on its um, greatest power um, aspiration. So I agree with you. Uh, what sort of an impact did COVID have on the thought processes of uh, people? So, you know, even with COVID, um, the CCP gave out a lot of different sorts of narratives. It's, it's, I think it, it blamed almost uh, every country uh, nearby and abroad, starting from the US to India, to all sorts of countries, um, to Africa, et cetera. So um, these sorts of narratives had different sorts of impact um, because it's state-led propaganda and the Chinese people living inside of China. And the ones who can only read, say, especially the newspapers and, you know, the older generation, which is not tech savvy. Um, for them, you know, it was easy to drill in this propaganda that, uh, well, it's come from outside. You know, it's uh, it's 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 a conspiracy against um, China, etc. Also, it's then easier to make people a quiz that, look, the government is here to save you. Yeah, you know, there are these destabilizing forces, but we are here to save you. Look, the CCP is all powerful. We will do everything. So you get people to acquiesce more easily that way. You know, if you drill in that sort of propaganda, we will protect you from this external foe, this virus which has been given to us uh, by, you know, external agencies, be it XYZ countries. That happened. Then when um, wave two happened in India, um, China practiced what is known as vulture journalism. Yeah. Um, absolute disregard for the de dead and uh, showcasing photographs of burning pyres in absolute disrespect for the dead. Um, they did it because they wanted to show to the domestic population that, you know, China is doing really well as far as COVID controls go. And uh, look, here is India, your little neighbor, the little irritating neighbor. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, we're doing much, much better. So which is why vulture journalism was practiced and um, we were mocked for actually dying. So that was absolutely below the belt and pathetic. But again, that was a propaganda to you know showcase to the Chinese people um, that it, it's just fine. Uh, but then when people were in under the lockdown, they started facing problems, of course, because food never reached on time. You know, um, there were these um, lower level carders who were supposed to go and deliver the food. But a food was not adequate for, say, a family of, you know, uh, six or seven because grandparents and uh, child and parents, etc. cetera. Um, or say medicines would not really reach um, sick children or sick people or sick elderly on time. So then the slow murmuring started. And um, even on social media, you know, a, Ch a lot of Chinese people inside of China as well, and, you know, even on um, other sorts of social media, which exist outside of China, there have been these murmurings that, you know, um, an old people, old man saying that, well, you know, I'm, I need an MRI. What do I do inside? You know, I'm going to die. But the lower level carder says that what really can I do? You know, uh, I'm also under orders. So yeah. that gave that self sense of helplessness and living with that sense of helplessness for three years, fire breaking out in Xinjiang, um, you know, primarily children dying and uh, fire brigade never reaching on time because the area is under lockdown. That was just too much for the people. So a lot of, you know, even in these three years, different sorts of, I'm pretty sure if I was a social experiment in China as a Chinese citizen for the CCP, my thought process as a Chinese citizen would have been varying across various time periods. Initially, okay, a lot of fervor, okay, you know, CCP is going to, our government is going to save us because the virus is from the US or from India or from Africa. And then, uh, hey, look, you know, um, India and US are reeling under COVID. The whole world is reeling under COVID, but CCP has done so well for us. And, you know, look, people are dying, etc. Okay, another sort of, an another separate set of emotions. Then finally, when food or basic amenity is not reaching, then separate sort of uh, emotions all together. So um, I think thought processes underwent a lot of changes as far as Chinese people are concerned. Interesting. Short question, but have the Chinese people learned how to protest? And have they tasted with victory with the COVID protests? Um, so, see, uh, Chinese people, I would say that, you know, um, the white paper revolution, white paper protests did lead the CCP to at least loosen the zero COVID policy. So in that sense, I would see it as a victory and uh, should have happened. Uh, but then it led to another sort of problem because, you know, the public health system was just not prepared. 
which is why right now um you know again i don't want to promote vulture journalism but just the way it happened for us or any other country for that matter uh, scores are getting infected and you know there are uh, lines of people queues uh, outside of hospitals or of you know um burial sites and bodies being just thrown into ditches um so those sorts of things are happening another sort of problem arose uh, because the ccp was just not prepared to immediately release the lockdown uh, basic amenities things were not really in place so but i would still say that um, at least the chinese people came out with that white paper um and protested with that white paper sheet of paper in their hands and at least that has resulted in some some sort of a loosening so um you know we are in a much happier situation we are not there so it's difficult to compare but um, if i could if i could say i guess being outside is much better than just being stuck inside without food and basic amenities so i would say that i would count that as a victory have the chinese people learned to protest uh, they've been protesting for against a lot of things over um over the years but given the all the sort of power and control that the ccp has uh they've not been the way that we envisage or the kind of results they bring out in democratic countries um i'm pretty sure though that this uh victory is going to lead chinese people to understand that there is utility in mobilizing and there is utility in coming together and having just saying no you know with a very strong uh putting their foot down very strongly so um i think this is going to be used as an example even in the future awesome we're going to take that up with our second conversation with you but my last question to you to finish this interesting episode is about the fact that uh, you know it's a it's a it's a paradigm when you look at china and you look at the people and you look at what's happening with them uh a lot of people think and that the chinese people will be overtrodden by the kind of propaganda that that is that has been fed to them and you know they would i'm sure there are a lot of people who believe the propaganda but there are few who don't of course i want to take an incident so uh, where when the when the yangtze clash happened recently uh i was on vpn and i was actually just going through some weibo posts and i typed yangtze and india indian army chinese army you know i don't remember which particular search pattern that got me to this but i read a couple of i don't know what they call them tweets or whatever they call them i'm not sure but posts by chinese people who said are you crazy why are you doing this to india india is a big country what if india attacks back we don't have money are we are under lockdown why are you doing this people weren't happy and they also had a realization that boss you are taking a panga with a larger power with a big power it's a big country you will land up into trouble you are killing our soldiers so i wonder where that person is who that person is where that came from but they were not just one they were multiple posts of this kind which led me to believe that they're not stupid hmm. they're probably tied up but not stupid would you agree with me and your comments on this so i i completely agree with you you know um, the chinese state does bombard them with propaganda and uh, there have been instances even when i was living in china that you know um, yeah propaganda against the japanese um, when the senkaku islands dispute was you know just it was it was just um, unfurling um, and you know um, chinese people a lot of them had taken to attacking the japanese people or writing um, monstrous things about them or breaking cars or breaking you know just just uh, messing with japanese uh, companies etc those sorts of things have happened but again the population of china is a too huge b uh, it's difficult to general, generalize but yeah not all of them are stupid they do mock you know otherwise coming up with this this sort of uh, thought process that you know okay if you know the sensor is blocking me too or is blocking hanan then let let's write herlan or let's write you know me or rice rabbit this is signs of ingenuity and this is just you know the way we humans generally are so they are also not stupid the chinese ccp did try to release one or two names uh, you know at different junctures uh, 
about their soldiers dying in um, you know the Galwan Valley clash they didn't give out all the names at one go but they did it you know sporadically um you know whenever they felt the need to unleash jingoism or hyper nationalism within china um and yeah then there were a lot of racist posts and attacking but yeah there are sane voices also within china which do understand that you know india is not you know the sort of adversary uh that china generally imagines in a japan or in the usa so why would you want to make that sort of an adversary out of india really there are a lot of those um sane voices they do understand that you know any military escalation does entail loss of lives they would not want that sort of loss of lives especially when the country itself is you know undergoing a lot of economic crisis so there are sane voices and um i've met a lot of these um, sane voices who've lived in china within china or have lived abroad who do which which do say that you know why does it's it's whatever the ccp does you know raking up um clashes with india or or trying to just find problems with india that that is unnecessary and uncalled for um that is there but yeah given the fact that you know everything is state led there have also been times when um hyper nationalism or hyper jingoism has been raked up just using these sorts of clashes be it galwan or yangtze valley etc so not everyone is stupid though and let's hope the same voices prevail absolutely have you had any ba- uh, close the door conversations with any chinese people who tell you this you know these guys are morons don't listen to them so in their own subtle ways they do and um, mm-hmm. there was this one uh, instance when i uh, did land up in um, beijing and back then i could not back in 2011 i could not speak a word of um, chinese except um, uh, four words ni hao hello zai qian bye see you again uh chungwo china and into india just four words and i landed in china anyways um it was difficult navigating but i did so um i think it was one in the first week of my classes and we were walking towards um you know the university where the classrooms are and i was with this chinese friend who i had met in india he was working at a certain think tank and we had met and we became friends in india and he did tell me that when you come ever to china do let me know i'll help you so I said sure why, why not um so we were walking to the campus and because he knew that back then i did not speak beyond four words he said sure why not so, so early in the morning i don't know why or what really provoked us but we were talking about arunachal pradesh and uh, like friendly you know friendly banter friendly conversation the way we have it in uh, way we did in india we always maintain that this political problem would not really come and interfere in our friendship so we were doing that all of a sudden he starts nudging me and uh, he starts saying um, he just does you know he asked me in sign language that you shut up i was like so i i looked at him and i was like but why why would you say that he said no just don't do that <clears throat> so i i was so i kept tugging at his hand i was like why would you not do that so are you scared of me why won't you have a discussion so after we moved past he said uh, just one thing be very careful when you're walking here did you see there was a police officer over there so i turned back because in india i'm not used to seeing police officers stationed with i within um, you know campuses i never took cognizance of that or maybe i was too engrossed in the conversation my friend basically asked me to shut up and i was like why would you do that you've never done that to me and uh, why would you not have a discussion so we walked and then after like 2 minutes he signaled to this police policeman who was standing behind us so i was like oh yeah i'm not used to seeing police officers in on campuses right so he was like yeah, but there's a police officer so you have to be very careful of about what you speak i was like i am talking about my country he's like but that's you know that's a problematic topic right i was like but i'm talking to you he's like but everyone's listening i was like okay that's okay he's like and if the police officer hears that you'll be pulled out and beaten i was like but he's not a woman officer how can he even touch me he's like you're not in india anymore so please understand this so i was like so yeah he just ended it there so but even just in that much he told me that even he thinks that this is bizarre you know and it's really bizarre that you have police officers on campuses who might pull out some foreigner student for talking about some disputed territory so yeah i've had the good luck of met such people who do understand that a lot of these things which the ccp does are bizarre but as you also mentioned i think previously in one of your um, statements it's just that they are constrained 
they don't really have a choice. It's their motherland, so what can they really do about it? Indeed, and that makes a lot of sense. But doctor, this has been an interesting episode and you know, uh, understanding the Chinese mentality will obviously not happen in 35 or 40 minutes. It will take a little longer than that and I, I'm going to be troubling you a lot more to kind of it's understand. It's been an absolute guys. pleasure, so it's no, not going to be trouble at all and I look forward to you know talking to you again. Fantastic. And uh, guys, this is this is an interesting, I'd love some feedback. I'd love some, uh, you know, the viewers that are going to be watching. I'd love a lot of feedback, a lot of questions. Uh, tell us what more you want to know about China. I've got my own agenda that I want to focus on. We've not really gone into COVID in that much depth. Uh, there's going to be a lot of impact because I think COVID is a big thing as I've also discussed on Dev Talks in many different occasions with various different people. Uh, so we'll get into that. We'll get into how the Chinese uh, thinking will change over time and what will happen exactly to the Chinese people and how they're going to react to various different situations. Till next time for another episode, Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Thank you so much. Bye. Take care.